make sure that you are measuring the other player. Can they actually hit hard enough where you wouldn't be able to just stand and catch it? You know, if when they're hitting while jumping, you've never seen them hit a ball so hard that you couldn't just grab it and catch it easily, then you shouldn't be up there. You shouldn't be with them. Hey, everybody. Thank you guys for coming in. We are in St. Pete Beach. We are at the Postcard Inn. And it doesn't look like it, but it's firing. We got... 10, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 coaches. We have a, a big group of coaches um, and the weather is perfect. I just flew in from New York. Brandon flew in from Richmond and people are coming from cold, snowy places. And we are off to a really good start here at this camp. It's so nice. It's so nice to work with the same coaches again, who know our rhythm, know our routine, know our coaching system. And to have so many campers come back every year at, well, I guess every few months now, that's such a special thing. It's so nice that the, a few of the campers that were here at the last New Year's camp came back again yeah. to our beach volleyball camp at another New Year's camp. Like the same time of year, same trip. They want to make it again. That's how much they like it. So that, that feels good. Yeah, it's always awesome to see uh, some returners, you know. It's uh, it's crazy. We Mark and I were... When we were introducing ourselves this morning, it was kind of a, a funny thing where I, I called you my one of my best friends, you know, and sure. you got a little offended. But <laughs> the, the funny thing about it is it's crazy because the, the journey that we're kind of on, um, and especially with these camps, um, the people that I meet on a daily basis or at these camps is when they show up again, I'm, it feels like it, it's a, a long lost friend that I haven't seen in a while. So. It's, yeah. it's definitely cool when you get some returners. Yeah, definitely a, a good squad. And it uh, sucks that some people just ran into travel trouble uh, and couldn't make it. But uh, we'll make it up to them. We'll get them back at another camp. Yeah. So a few announcements from our side. Yes, we are at our camp because so many people have had to cancel due to travel, flights, changes, everything like that. We are opening up day passes. So if you're local or if you want to join at the last minute, you want to make a road trip or a flight down to Florida, come along and we have day passes available at St. Pete Beach. Uh, I don't know about hotel rooms. You will have to check in with the postcard in in St. Pete Beach. We also have our camp next week. That is still full. And uh, we have 12 spots left i think this time last week we had something like 18 or 19 and now we have 12 for the april 3rd camp so if you guys want to come out from april 3rd to 10th st pete beach we are rocking and rolling you go to betterbeach.com forward slash camps now the most important thing that i want to talk about is going to be our athletic foundations challenge okay personally i know the last two years have been extremely tough on everybody um not not only like emotional and sad but it it's it's made me personally feel like crap uh lost a lot of competitive motivation because we didn't know when tournaments were going to be open didn't know when gyms were going to be open so you always have to find a way to work out uh and you know a quarter of the people are practicing three quarters are not and motivation kind of went out the window and I'm making a promise to myself this year to be absolutely my best self. And so I'm going to start in a big way. And if you feel the same way, if you feel like you want to kickstart this year and you want to start it the right way, there is a right way to start training. So we have a seven day workout every day. I'm going to send you mobility workouts and prehab and rehab workouts to strengthen your shoulders, activate your glutes, and to make sure that all of your imbalances start to help themselves. We start to fix them. We start to fix the imbalances and the injuries because I'm sure there are a lot of you out there that every new year you get fired up, you hit this new workout program and you fizzle after maybe two and a half, three weeks. Well, this program is gonna get you started in the right way so you don't crush your soreness, you don't, uh, burn yourself out at the first you know shot of the gun and what we are going to do is send you those mobility workouts i'm going to be working with a live group and from there if you choose to go ahead and come with us for the 60 day max vertical then we're going to be doing that live as well uh, but the first 
step is going to betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations, betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations. We are getting our group together. That's going to start in seven days. In seven days, I'm going to send everybody who has signed up their workout for that day. We're going to do it live. We're going to have questions in the Facebook group so that you can ask, you can post your videos. We can see your technique and do everything the right way from the start. So if you're sick of how you felt for the last two years because you either felt lazy, lost motivation, ate and drank the wrong way, this is going to be how we start and we're going to start together and we're going to do it in a group and we're going to push each other to be healthier and set the foundation so that we can get strong, fast and athletic together. So go ahead to betterbeach.com forward slash foundations. It's just $27 for a full week of live training, all of the workouts. Plus, I'm sending you all of our nutrition checklists and challenges. We have an eight-week nutrition challenge. We have a tournament and practice nutrition checklist, which is going to tell you what to eat, when to eat, how much of it for tournaments, which is different than practices, which would be different than just a single match. And we will send you all of those write-ups, all of the PDFs we've created. And uh, you can find that again at betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations. And we're also including three full vertical jump workouts with that. If you want to start those two years the right way, start strong, start fit, start mobile, join up. And that's all as far as the new programs go. So today, we are going to talk about block defense, and we're going to talk about it quick. All right. So uh, a lot of people, I think, think you have to be a blocker in order to learn about block defense, but that's just not true. So we're going to teach you how to play good defense, quick tips, quick hitters to play defense better as a blocker or a peeler. So Brandon, I'm going to throw it over to you. What is the first thing people should know about block defense? So I'm going to kind of uh, take it from what you started it off with saying that it doesn't matter if you're a blocker. You know, and the one thing that I really like that we do, uh, especially when we're at our camps, when we're at our classes and we're talking about block defense, is we actually don't even use the word blocker. We use the word net protector. Okay, and the reason I like that is because it, it makes – your side have to establish a defense. Um, and what I mean by that is, and we'll go into this a little bit, um, there's your typical block calls that you would, you would do if you were playing with a partner um, very quickly. If, if we're starting at a very basic level, if we're a beginner or we're an intermediate, then most likely you're either running a one block or a two block, okay? A one block means that you as the blocker are responsible for blocking or taking up the line. I'll explain that a little bit further in a second. And if you hold up a two, then that means that you are responsible for blocking or taking the cross court side of the court. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that I say you're responsible for taking that side is that when you're showing your, your defender or your server what block you plan on doing or what block you want them to do, then you're not necessarily telling them that you are 100% going to stay up at the net. Um, it just means that that's the area of court that you plan on protecting. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people, if you are, so now kind of going back to this net protector idea is if you're able to get your whole hand over the net, then you can consider yourself a blocker. Okay. If you cannot, then Unfortunately, you're not really doing that much up at the net uh, if you decide to stay and block. If you can touch the ball and stop it from coming over like it's an overset, then that might be an opportunity for you to for you to stay up there and try to block. But most likely what's going to happen is once you see that set and you're still up at the net, remember, even if you're not a blocker, you're a net protector, you see that set and if it's coming over to the net, then that's when you would stay there, you would make your play. Whether it's a pass or if you wanna attack it or redirect it back on the other side, that's when you would stay. If that setter makes that set and you're a net protector, you're one of the people that can't get your hand over the net, 
then it's your responsibility to get off the net. Okay. And what I mean by get off the net is you would peel and you would use your footwork. What we, what we say is even start, start in a surfer's position with one foot closer, closer to the net and your body open to your, to your partner. And then once you see that that set isn't going over the net, then it's your job to get off the net quick and help your defender play defense. Um, I think that that's one of the big mis misconceptions of especially beginners and intermediates is that if they can't block or they're not a blocker, then they just stay back in the court and they have two people playing defense. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really like that at all because if you're, if you're playing against anybody that has an ability to spike hard, then you're not making them think about anything, okay? Even if you are even if you are on your side of the court and you pull off the net and you are up at the net acting as a net protector, then that blocker, that attacker on the other side is still looking at you and saying, okay, the defender's over here. So they're already choosing what they're going to do. So if you're a net protector, you go up to the net, you take away your side, you show them whether it's a one or a two, and then you're able to get back and play defense. I think you're just setting yourself up for more opportunities to keep the play alive. You might might not win all the points, but I think you're putting yourself in a better opportunity to keep that play alive and possibly score. I do like that. I, I think too many people just try to block too much. Uh, I, we talked to uh, one of our campers today, Kayla. Uh, Kayla, when you see this episode in the future, uh, we had to talk about her and she physical girl. She was able to jump. Um, she's strong and she got you know full forearms over the net but she was blocking against somebody who was like five two and even on her best jump on the best set wouldn't be able to hit the ball hard down so i go you can block right and she's like yeah i'm a good blocker i go that's great can she hit mm -hmm. is she a hard ball threat to you and if that person's not a hard ball threat to you it doesn't really matter how big you are unless you're guard Gantuan, and you're going to take up a ton of space by jumping and blocking. But the the 99.9% the .9 of us will not take up enough space to merit staying up there and blocking when 99% of the world's humans are actually attacking, right? It takes a very special athletic high individual to be able to hit hard and attack and merit having a blocker against them. So just make sure that you guys are measuring yourself. Can you get your hands over the net? Like Brandon said, make sure that you are measuring the other player. Can they actually hit hard enough where you wouldn't be able to just stand and catch it? You know, if when they're hitting while jumping, you've never seen them hit a ball so hard that you couldn't just grab it and catch it easily, then you shouldn't be up there. You shouldn't be with them. Right. And then even on a, like a medium athletic attacker, how far are they from the net? Are they in balance now? Are they going to hit? Because some people can hit when situations are perfect and some people just absolutely um, cannot. Right. You know, some people can hit when it's when it's uh, in system, out of system, they'll still bring heat. But again, those are the AVP players. Those are like the monsters. So you need to get out of there more often, play ground defense. And we did run into a little situation about overpasses. And Brandon mentioned just kind of playing it back or playing it to myself. More and more and more, I think players should be passing that first ball when it comes over because that is not your ideal set, right? When you get that sense of, eh, I'm kind of under it or it's going back behind my head, just release that necessity to hit the ball and go in and play it. Because think about it, when they overpass, that's not you getting a controlled set that you want. It's kind of a surprise. So if it's right on the net and you can absolutely like thunder it because you're in the best possible position, then yeah, okay, attack it, but do it wisely so that you hit it to a spot. If it's off balance, if you feel yourself, you have to lean or you have to pursue it or you have to reach over your head, it's way better to pass that. Get your set, of course, unless you have an absolute garbage setter, right? <laughs> <laughs> then take your chances. Right. But if you can control the first two touches and get the play that you design that you want, you'll probably side out better than kind of hitting at two defenders who are there when you're off balance. Right. Or even thinking about setting your partner. 
Booyah. You know, it doesn't mean that you need to take all three touches. It's just a matter of if you can put that ball up, let's say I'm blocking and you're defending, mm -hmm. then maybe instead of me trying to just hit it when I'm awkward, I can just think about taking some steps off the net and setting you so that you have that full approach, full vision of the court, um, which probably lets you score a little bit easier. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, I, like I do it. want to talk about uh, something for all the like former indoor players out there. I want to talk about getting outside the blocker because that was something that kind of that hurt me for a while as a defender. Uh, most people are taught that like wherever that blocker is blocking, you should step and play the area outside their hands. And the problem with this is that if you stick to that, sometimes your blocker will dive in or sometimes they'll be in a position that is taking up more than what exactly they're supposed to. So if you feel that hand in front of you, like the blocker's hand in between the ball that's being attacked and yourself, all of a sudden you have this need like, oh, I'm not in a diggable area. But as beach volleyball players, we have to remember that attackers have shots as well. So if you're always fighting to play hard-driven defense outside of blocker's hands or fill that pocket, like some people say, then you're going to make this fast, late move. And that big, fast, late move is going to give up your spot because you'll, you'll become really easy to see for the attacker. And then they can just fluff it wherever they want to. They don't even have to be accurate at that point. They just have to make the right decision on the half of the court. And because you're off balance, because you're trying to jump into that pocket, they get the easy kill, the easy shot. So find your best position in defense. And as a defender, read the hitter. Don't read the hitter around your blocker. If you're both are doing your job correctly, then you would get a block and a dig, you know, basically on the same swing. Because if the blocker sees what you're going to do, boom, they should take over, right? If the defender sees what you're going to do, then they're going to step into where you're hitting not the area outside the blocker. And that was something that as a libero, all I did for indoor was fill holes. I would find wherever the seam was because I had four other defenders around me who could do everything else. So the ability to sit there, even if a blocker is a little bit in front of you, that's good because now it just means that your blockers got your responsibility and you are still able to chase shots. So my number one is blocker. You should read the hitter and try to put yourself where they're hitting. The line and the cross call, really, that's for when you the hitter is so good that they're making all these amazing decisions around you. And it means that you don't know where they're going, right? Great defenders and great blockers see what the hitter is doing and they jump into there. So I want blockers in my world to be way more aggressive, get more touches, Right. Unless, you know, the blocker's hands or have such terrible shape or every time it hits them, it's a kill or a tool. If my blocker is getting touches, I'm going to keep celebrating that. Right. It means at least the hitter has to think about them. So I'm totally OK with my blocker jumping in if they read the right, if they give me the right decision. If they say, I did this because I saw him leaning in. So I jumped across. Yes. Good answer. I'm fine with that partner. You know, and if we get tooled move on. So I think more people should read, more defenders should sit in that pocket and not worry about having to get outside their blocker. Yeah, it sounds like a, uh, it, if, if defenders are making that really quick last second move, it's probably such a sharp angle for that attacker that I don't really like their odds that much on that hit anyway. You know, right. like if it's tight enough to where they can go that sharp, then the blocker might touch it. Maybe they'll get a block or they might end up making some errors out of bounds. Um, but so kind of piggybacking off of you and talking about the blockers lineup and being more aggressive as a blocker. One thing that was said to me was to make my lineup almost like I'm taking a charge in basketball. Can I, can I pause you for a second? Because we got Ricardo who just joined our Instagram live stream. Ricardo <laughs> Santos is on our live stream. So hi, Ricardo. Yeah, and one of the this, best. Is, this is a guy, <laughs> Ricardo, I'm still waiting for my phone call so we can play a tournament together. Um, but he's saying exactly this to a lot of his defenders. I know that I've, I've uh, talked to some of the defenders that he's played with. And he says, you just sit in the middle. Let me take care of the hitter. 
right? He's like so big and his reading is so good that he's doing consistently exactly what we're talking about, taking that charge and then jumping into where the hitter is going. He goes, you just need to sit in the middle of the court and chase shots. I'll take over everything that's hard driven. We all don't have Ricardo in front of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But it, we'd be lucky if we did. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying uh, take oh, the no. charge. You go ahead yeah, and finish so, up. And what I mean by that is it, I think it, it helps blockers understand where they should be setting up. You know, I think a lot of blockers, they think about, oh, I'm, I'm blocking line. I'm blocking cross. And then their next thought is, oh, it's a left side player. It's a right side player. You know, so they kind of just run over to that side of the court and they just – kind of jump trying to read where the set is but sometimes they're just not in the right spot and they're either way too far outside or way too far in and I think what I'm talking about when I say take a charge is imagine if we're looking at the blockers or sorry we're looking at the attackers line of approach or where their energy is taking them okay so what you should do as a blocker is when that attacker is making their move they're shuffling out they're shuffling in whatever they're doing and then they're starting their approach. It's your job to read that attacker and kind of jump in front of them so that if they were, if they didn't jump and they just kept running underneath the net, they would run right into the center of your chest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think if we can get that lineup good, then we can actually start protecting the side of the court that we said we were going to take, you know, and it doesn't always have to be this big up and down block. You're starting to see it from a lot of smaller players too, is that, now they're making their, their moves together and they're deciding, okay, now I've taken the spot. Now I'm going to take away my side of the court. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to talking about what you're talking about with the defender setting up is that you don't necessarily need to be outside of me too much um, because when I finish my move, I'm still taking my responsibility. You know what mm -hmm. I'm taking. But if you make that last second quick jump, then they might hit it right at you and where you would have gotten an easy dig. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, that blocker can get established quick, get set up to where that attacker would run right into the middle of their chest. And then your, your hands are the things that are physically taking the area of the court, whether it's a line block or a cross block. Um, your hands are going to do that. You know, and so I think if we can get that set up to be correct, then it kind of helps the rest of the defense kind of feel smooth as well. Definitely. Definitely. So, uh, can we talk about base hand position for blockers? Yeah, we can. <laughs> Thanks, man. As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's, here's something that Ryan Darty had, had this story. Um, and, and many people just think about like taking line or taking cross, right? Where you said, make sure that you're taking the charge, make sure that you're getting your chest right where that person's going. Each hand then is now responsible for a different area of the court. So if you're promising line for most hitters, right? If line is behind my right shoulder. Now, if I'm taking line, that means that the only thing my right hand has to do is take up, up to that deep corner. If somebody wants to bounce inside of 10 feet and get me fine, but I'm going to find the line. I'm going to look at that back corner of the court and I'm going to look where that ball is. And I'm going to put my hand right in the middle of that. So that that line, that straight line from the corner to the ball is taken up by my right hand. And if I'm in a Frankenstein pose here, because I don't want to have this like this, I want my hands outside my shoulders. Why? Because no hitters will like try to hit right at your head. At least most won't. So right? you get to a really high level. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so people get scared. They see the body mass and they try to hit around it. So if you block like this with your hands in between your shoulders, then you're blocking the area that hitters are intentionally avoiding because they try to avoid your body mass. So that's what they see in the corner of their eyes. So your hands need to position outside of that. So if your right hand is blocking that line, you've already made the straight line from the corner of the court to the ball and your right hand takes that and your right hand is outside your shoulder. Now your left hand is free to take up more meat right your left hand can take it can reach extra wide and go and take cross or it can stay a little bit narrower but still just outside your shoulder and then it'll take the seam of the middle of the court and i too many people block with their entire body blocking line which means that your right hand is now blocking a bunch of out of bounds balls balls that will be hit out of bounds and your left hand is blocking like just maybe a third of the court 
So now the hitter has two thirds of the court to just juice balls at your defender and all the blockers, they turn around they're like, Hey, you got to dig that. And it's like, you're basically leaving me with the entire court to defend blockers have to get more involved. And in order to get more involved, one hand takes the call and the other takes the rest of the court outside their shoulder and is kind of able to move around there so that you know we're just talking about base blocking here but i think that's very important for people to understand that your body doesn't take the line your body doesn't take the dissection from uh the back corner to where that player is like you said we get in that charge position and then your hand takes that line single hand and then right. the other one can float and that'll be a base block until you get to the, like the advanced stages of reading and threes and fours where you have full commits but for your base blocking spread those hands out make sure they're outside your shoulders and then make sure that your single hand is taking one call and the other hand is free to float around yeah and i think the important thing to pick up on when we're talking about that extra hand that is going to start to be a little loose when you're when you're moving around mm -hmm. There's two errors that I see a lot. One, you're over, kind of over eager to touch the ball. So a lot of people will touch that ball when it's they they just move their hand out to the side to take the cross, mm -hmm. and their their hand isn't even over the net. Okay, so you got to make sure like whenever if you are touching the ball, your hand needs to be over the net. So it needs yeah. to be breaking that plane. Um, and then the second thing is really just allowing yourself to not let this other hand come with you. You know, uh, we talked about the establishing the line. So if my right hand, I got you, if my, brother. If my, if my right hand, oh, that's a pretty bad glare. If my right hand is taking the line and then this left hand is taking the cross, a lot of times what you'll see is I see that it's going cross. So my left hand will go, but then my right hand will follow, which mm -hmm. now is opening up that initial responsibility that I said, I promise you I'm not giving up this point to this spot. Um, obviously, if I'm the blocker and I say, oh man, completely fooled me. I read hard cross all day long. I, I jumped, I tried, to, I tried to just beat it. That's an answer we're okay with, but we still wanna make sure that we're establishing that initial position. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of kind of keep going on this. Um, when we're talking about our setup and we're talking about what these hands should be doing, I think we can also talk about how we should be moving. You know, one of, one of the big issues that I see with blockers when they're starting out is that they're way too tight to the net. So like if the net is right here, we see blockers get into this position before they start. Um, and when you do that, more than likely, when you go jump, you're actually going to be pulling your hands off the net more because that's just what you have to do to avoid the net so that you don't make a fault. Um, so I think something that I do is I put my arms kind of at a, a 90 degree angle mm -hmm. and I touch, I have my hands here. So I'm still, my palms are still facing the attacker. Uh, instead of having my chest really close to the net and my hands by my side, what I, what I try to focus on is keeping my elbows pressed to my body. Okay. And then, I put my arms at a 90 degree angle. And when I do this, it creates probably, I don't know, a foot and a half, two feet of space between me and the net. Um, and that's important because now what I've done is I've allowed myself to use a side shuffle to get from location to location. And when I go up to jump, I can get a full bend, I can get full arm movement. And then once I get up, I can actually press over the net to make that block. I think a lot of times when if you're not the per if you're not creating that 90 degree angle to where you're getting space from the net, maybe a foot and a half, um, then when you're jumping and your hands are kind of beside you, then when you're going up into the air, you're probably having a hard time penetrating over the net. Mm -hmm. So if you're a person that you notice that you get a lot of block touches, but for some reason they keep falling on your side of the net then I can almost guarantee you that your issue is that you're starting too close to the net when you're jumping and you're actually, your hands aren't even over the net when you're blocking. And we need to make sure that when you are blocking, you are trying to penetrate onto their half of the court, which means that you need to be on, that your hands should be on the other team's side of the net when you're blocking, not your own. Definitely. Well, like we said, this one, uh, this one was going to have to be short. 
uh, we have we're in the middle of a camp, so uh, our tent and our, and our swag booth is is sitting there waiting for us, and <laughs> we do have to start a practice here in 30 minutes. So I'm going to hang around. I'm going to do the Q and A with you guys, but I just want to again reemphasize uh, this seven day athletic foundations challenge. We are going to be going through your mobility, your warm up, and every band exercise you should be doing on and or on and off the court. So it's a seven day athletic foundations challenge. We're going to start this year the right way. It starts January 3rd. If you go to betterbeach.com forward slash foundations, you get three vertical jump workouts. You get an eight week nutrition challenge. You get a tournament and practice nutrition checklist, which tells you what to eat, when to eat and how much of it for matches which is different than tournaments, which is different than practices, which can be different from workouts, okay? So if you wanna come along for that ride, it's a seven day challenge. I'm gonna be coaching you guys live and I'm gonna be giving you all the live feedback because you get to post all of your videos on a private Facebook group where we will be interacting every day and I will be telling you and helping you with where you're tight, how you should modify different exercises and what you can do to prepare your body to be strong fast and athletic for this entire season so please start the right way this year so you don't hurt yourself and more importantly eh, just as important you don't burn out right we're gonna start off nice and easy with a ton of body weight workouts so that you can acclimate and then you'll be ready to build that strength and build the speed later in the season betterbeach.com forward slash foundations that's where you can find out more about it and sign up that's on january third so you have to sign up before january 2nd and we're going to start this year together yeah and just to kind of add on to that um i i personally i don't i don't do this often but i personally think that this is probably one of our most valuable offers that you've ever come up with um i know for me i've always been strong like when i was in college getting strong wasn't hard um but one thing that i always my biggest downfall injuries and mobility mm -hmm. um it, and it was crazy when i when i first moved out to california which three years ago i kind of thought that i was at my peak you know i was like you know what might not get much better than this you know and then i worked out specifically with you for i think six months in the off season two mm -hmm. years ago garage and, workouts and, yeah and literally that the mobility and the, finding these little strengths with my shoulders, with my hips, um, it literally, that alone erased points that I was losing in games. You know, I went from somebody who was, in my opinion, like a high level qualifier player to somebody that was competing with main draw guys. And a lot of it, had, obviously I was in great practices run by great coaches, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that my body was just able to move the right way and in a strong way. So, um, yeah, if you're listening and you're thinking about it, I know I'm, I'm probably a little biased, but, um, I, it's, it's, it truly is going to be phenomenal, especially for the price point that it's coming up. 27 bucks, which is one day pass at a gym and I will be coaching you live and you get to upload your videos live every day. Plus you get all of the workouts and nutrition list. So uh, it's a great deal. I want you guys to come along for the ride better at beach.com forward slash foundations. So guys, uh, if you want to participate in the Q and a, go ahead and you can type in to the chat. Uh, you have the chat on YouTube. You have the chat on Facebook. I am more than happy to answer any questions that you have right now. Let me know if you guys have any questions uh, and I can get the ball rolling here because we are eventually going to bring on some guests. So here's what I want to hear from you, a little chat participation. What, if any, or sorry, who, if any guests would you like to hear from? Would you like us to interview and to learn from? I want to hear what guest you want us to bring on and what you would want them to cover. So go ahead and uh, in the chat, let me know what's going on. All right. I want to hear what guests we should bring on and what you want them to teach on one of our live video podcasts here. All right. Zachary Bay, not answering the question, 
but uh, this is a good question to cover. So Zach, he says, who should call the blocker to peel, the blocker or the defender? That's a read that both of us need to make. It's not, you wouldn't, as a good defender, you can recognize that. And you could say stuff like, he's off, he's off, right? To help your blocker start recognizing if they should peel. You're going to be able to see certain things. Hopefully you guys are on the same page because if you both see the same thing, then the blocker would know to just either step up and raise their hands or drop back so that they're ready for the hard driven middle ball. Uh, the blocker at the, same, at the same time, they should be the one who's recognizing, all right, I'm going to be useless here or I'm just going to get in the way and I can make a better controlled play on the ground. So there's really no call, Zach. It's just when you do it, when you leave, and then you need to discuss with your partner why you should peel, how much you should peel. Okay, so don't worry about who needs to call. Um, just make sure that you guys are on the same page and you practice it. Practice it together. And if you start seeing something like, hey, anytime he has an inside set, he shoots, we should peel then, that's what you should do. But we shouldn't discuss things in retrospect. We should discuss what we saw in the moment and see if we can associate it with what the next play might be or if there's a habit coming down the road. Okay. Uh, Edward Bransama said we should bring on Casey Patterson. Again, we have brought on Casey Patterson. And if you look uh, better at Beach, you search better at Beach Casey Patterson on our YouTube channel, you can see a great interview with him where we talk a lot about partnership and energy building. And we did even a little video analysis with him uh, about his Manhattan Beach Open win. So uh, since you're already on YouTube, Edward, just go ahead and search Casey Patterson better at beach and his interviews should come up there. All right, Kevin Passmore, my uh, my meme master. <laughs> Hayden, you want John Hayden on to talk about defensive strategy and longevity from a physical health standpoint. I think that would be a fantastic lesson. Um, and that's good. I, I like that. Hayden's the master of longevity, obviously. He's 48, 49 now and still crushing it. So all right, Babsy, what up, girl? So you want to bring on Kelly Clays to talk about blocking? Yeah, I'm guessing specifically in the women's game and the two ball. Down with that. And I love having Casey on or Kelly on. Uh, she's just a cool, good person, and she's goofy and fun, uh, fun to travel with. And uh, I, it would be a fun interview to talk with her. Maybe interview her and Sarah at the same time. Uh, Edward Bransama said we should talk about strategic siding out and defense with high level mindset and what he thinks he looks for in the defense and the offense of the other team. That'll be with Casey Patterson. That'd be cool. Uh, a McKibben collab video. We'd be down with that. They have a bunch of projects in the work and we know they're slammed with how much they edit. Uh, so I would love to get them out. Um, and I'd love to start practicing against them again soon. But we'll see. Zachary Bay, you want Taylor Crab on reading the shot. Defense from Taylor Crab on reading the shot. Cool, Zach. Uh, guys, these are all great ideas. And uh, we would love to bring these guests on. And you know what helps us? Anytime you guys like, subscribe, share what we're doing here. Uh, that helps us more than you know. The bigger audience that we get, the more people are encouraged to join up with us, the more companies can kind of support us and partner with us and the better content we can bring to you guys. So if you are watching and you're not, you haven't liked the video, just click that. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And it, once this is all done, go ahead and share it. It's just anything on Facebook, on Instagram, it really helps us, really goes a long way. Okay, uh, Zach Miller, last one. You said you want to talk to Tri Born, blocking and how to keep a high level mental game. Absolutely, uh, Tri is an incredible blocker, and it's if he had the same speed, agility, and sense uh, that, and you added on three or four inches to his height he would be far and away the world's best blocker. Uh, he doesn't have that same height, that same length that Andy Mole has, but he has great moves, great vision, and superior hand shape. Uh, and I think 
he attributes a lot of that to working with Haydn and being an absolute student of the game. And he actually did, he told me he did a lot of work on a women's net, just learning how to specifically shape your hands for that contact so that when it does hit you, it doesn't just rebound back to the other team. It goes straight down. So um, that's it. Oh, Burizar Actini signed up for the April camp. Let's go. April 3rd to April 10th, we are in St. Pete again. So you are more than welcome to sign up. That's at betterbeach.com forward slash camps. And guys, like I said, start this year the right way. Join me for seven day athletic foundations challenge. I'll be coaching you and leading you through body weight workouts along with some band workouts so that we can get you started right and build a base for strength and speed as we move into the year. Everybody who signs up for the seven day athletic foundations challenge is going to get a special offer where you can sign up for the full 60 day max vertical program and our online coaching program where we work with you twice a week over video, give you drills, let you uh, post your technique, post your drills, post your workouts, and we get in there and we coach you live. So thank you guys so much for getting involved. Thank you for hanging out. I got to go because we got a camp to lead and uh, all the best to you and yours. Happy holidays. I will see you all on Wednesday. If there's anything I need to know, anything you want me to know, any questions you have, just go ahead, get in touch with me at Mark Burke on Instagram, Mark Burke Beach Volleyball on Facebook. Um, or if you have camp specific questions, you can always email support at betteratbeach.com. We are happy to answer anything. And if you want us to bring ourselves to a clinic in your hometown, go to betteratbeach.com forward slash clinics and sign that form and we can come and hang out with you. All right, guys. Have a good time. Um, be looking on our social media for all the posts and cool stuff that we're doing here in St. Pete. Toodles.